thank you all for being here and thank you, Nick, for the uh, introduction. It's truly a, an honor and privilege of ours uh, to be here today on the uh, 15th anniversary of the tragedy in Oklahoma City. Um, and it's, and it's you know, not very often that the President of the United States recognizes your work. So it's uh, also certainly uh, very, very special. Um, we, uh, we want to share uh, images that document the process that uh, basically we went through in developing the art ideas and the actual physical design. How many of you have actually been to the Oklahoma City National Board? Okay. Um, well, those of you who haven't, we certainly encourage you to, to, uh, to come join us in Oklahoma City. Call us and we'd love to give you a tour. Uh, we live very close to the, to the site. Um, and also, um, uh, next weekend, uh, next Sunday, is the Oklahoma City National Memorial Marathon, one of the best marathons in the United States. It is one of the most uh, spectacular moments of civic pride you could ever imagine. Uh, there are 15, 20,000 people gathered there at the site, and uh, it's just a beautiful place to watch the sunrise and to see so many people participate in an act of hope. And that is very much what we hoped to capture in our work uh, of the design that we'll talk about here now. Um, Tori and I were, uh, we were in Berlin at the time of the bombing in 1995. We had been practicing uh, in Germany for a few years already. And um, it was actually through a newscast on American radio that we heard. It was the morning of April 20th that we actually first heard the bombing. Um, but, you know, that idea of context, you know, yes, we were in Berlin, the tragedy in the heartland of the United States, but there were so many other contexts that we had to very quickly become aware of as we were charged uh, uh, to start to think about what this design could be. The, the slide up on the screen right now is an attempt to start to walk through so many other memorials uh, that have been built over the past uh, roughly 200 years in the United States. And in developing our work, it was important for us to continue to recall, remember that, that, that this memorial uh, may or may not learn from previously built memorials, and that our work in turn may begin to inform how future generations begin to document their own response to moments and places of tragedy. One other important uh, detail to, to keep in mind is most memorials are actually not built on the place of the tragedy they seek to engage. <coughs> most memorials that we know are you know, at the town square and obelisks that recalls the fallen brothers and sisters of a community, or it's on the, uh, the mall in Washington, right? Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, and so forth. Very few are actually built on the site of the tragedy. And that was an important detail that we had to respect because it changed the way we understood our work. It had to be something that is not only of national significance, but ultimately had to be something that spoke of this place in this time, this community, their loss. And so we'll. Um, Carry forward now, um, uh, this really starts to underscore the distance, you know, living in Berlin and the tragedy there in Oklahoma City. And for us, you know, at the time, you know, we were basically taking the train every day to work in Berlin. This is what we saw every day. This was actually the wrapping of the Reichstag in Berlin, Germany. And it was an incredible moment in German history because it symbolized the moving past, this horrible, half century of dark clouds brought on by Nazism. And it was Germany's return to Berlin as a, state ca as a country's capital. And it was their way of celebrating transparency and celebration of democracy. And it seemed like such an irony for us to go by this here, symbol of triumph of democracy, and then to learn that same time that somebody decided they didn't believe the democratic process is the right process. And it was, a, it was a challenging juxtaposition. It was a surprise. You know, we as Americans were so proud of what we are to the world, democracy, the voice of the people. And so it was such a surprise to see this happen at, in, in the heart of our country. 
the Oklahoma City National Memorial Competition was a two-stage memorial competition. Um, basically, an announcement had been put out in late 1996 for anyone anywhere in the world, you didn't have to be an architect, uh, to submit a design for this place. And we uh, only found out about the memorial competition in January of 97 and uh, immediately ordered the packet. And the document there on the left is, a, is the actual copy of the mission statement from which Nick cited the actual preamble to that mission statement. And it was that document that this 350 person task force, members of the community of Oklahoma City, put together in an attempt to articulate what the vision for that memorial should be. And one of the beautiful things about the document is they never told us what it should look like. They never said it had to have this or had to have that. It was so beautifully articulated by presenting a vision. What were the goals? What were the efforts this community wanted to uh, convey for this and future generations? And so for us, it was a very special document that allowed us a lot of leeway in developing our design. Okay, I'm gonna jump in really quick. I always like I always like to come and listen to my husband talk. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I say a few words. Um, I just wanted to, to to throw in sort of a conjunction with him talking about this mission statement and this very first thing that they sent out to the uh, people who wanted to participate was already at this point they had used a very inclusive process, and this was something that we would really benefit from later on as we were selected and worked with family members and survivors, um, but they had already sort of established that. They'd already put that in place a, way before we came into the picture. And I think that was um, one of the hallmarks, really, of, of what was so wonderful about Oklahoma City and how they engaged this, you know, this tragedy and then how they dealt with it afterwards. Is they, they employed a very inclusive, they tried to listen, they tried to give everyone who wanted to a chance to be heard um, with the hopes that uh, when you have a chance to speak and be heard, that you will be more personally invested in it and feel like it's, it's part of what you helped create too. So I just want to throw that in that, you know, already here, this, this was this uh, mission statement they sent out, this whole program was already, are already the result of a lot of people coming together in an, ex in an inclusive process. Um, I also want to throw in that um, we we saw we were working at uh, a firm in, in Berlin. We were doing architecture there, and this competition we did on the side, which is something really typical of of young people in Germany who don't have kids <laughs> and have other and, and have free time in, in the evening, um, especially in the world of architecture, to do competitions on the side. And so we chose this one. Um, I think this felt like a lot more than a regular competition we would do on the side. We felt like, gosh, here's a chance where we can help. Maybe we can help these people. Um, and I think even by us just submitting something, that helps. I mean, I think it really helped that they received 624 entries. You know, it doesn't matter that all of those, that everyone didn't win. They saw um, hope and caring from 23 different countries and people submitting, you know, designs. And I think we just felt like, it doesn't matter if we win. We just want to show them, you know, we want to give them some ideas. And if, if they can use those, that is great. And if they can't, then we hope they find some they can use. So we, that was our motivation in the beginning for just wanting to participate in this competition. Um, but the, um, you know, as, as we started to uh, try and understand what it is the memorial should be through that document, it was also important to you know, recognize the site itself. Um, as I mentioned, you know, you know, we were charged, or you know, all those who wanted to be a part of that competition were charged with trying to articulate a, a memorial place that made sense on this particular site. Here you see the the, uh, the grassy footprint of what was the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, Federal Courthouse just to the south, and the rest of downtown Oklahoma City, church to the west, and a church here just immediately to the east. Here you had Fifth Street, it was approximately here that the van with the bomb was parked. And then to the north, there were two buildings immediately north of the uh, Murrah building. And of course, uh, what became known as the survivor tree in American Elm, uh, 
that is uh, 85, close to 90 years old now. Um, but you know, it's what's so important to remember is that you know this was just another city block in Oklahoma City, and the image you see here is you know a few months later, uh, the uh, uh, rescue and recovery efforts had been completed, and it was time to uh, remove the what was left of the buildings uh, from the site, and so. It's also important to note that the, uh, the site, you know, certainly from an architectural standpoint, that uh, over here on Robinson Street is pretty high and the site slopes down to the west uh, towards Harvey Street. And another important uh, feature that we noted in, in trying to understand the site was the fact that the, the survivor tree itself actually stands on the natural high point of the site. And so it's actually from, you know, underneath the canopy of this great tree that you have this view of the memorial site as well as the rest of the city beyond. And so those were some uh, important pieces uh, for us to take note of, but ultimately the most important was that preamble to the mission statement. And this is really what guided, you know, as Tori mentioned, all the processes and discussions prior to uh, the, the creation of a memorial competition and also, you know, our job to, to fit into that process. But the heart of, of this project and all efforts in Oklahoma City as it relates to the memorial focus on the idea of remembering those who were killed, those who survived, and those changed forever. This memorial needed to help people understand the impact of violence, and we were asked to create something that would offer comfort, strength, peace, hope, and serenity. So these were the ultimate guiding ideas in our work and all subsequent uh, uh, ideas and processes. We, um, we quickly built a, uh, a, a, a model, a physical model, out of uh, cardboard, basically, of the site as it existed, and then read and reread the mission statement over and over again. And really, the design, the core of the design, uh, developed over a period of six weeks, roughly, from uh, mid late January up until the beginning of uh, March. And, um, you know, the Polaroids you see here, we were actually scheduling, we were taking a, a ski trip in February, and it was the first time I'd ever been to the Alps. But we kept, we took all our notes and sketchbooks with on that trip, uh, on the train, and continued to reread and sketch, to deliberate the mission statement, and look at these little Polaroid photos of that, of the site as it existed in that photograph you just saw. So we never really kind of let go once we got engaged and continued to talk a bit about you know, what the potentials for the site and the mission statement would be. Um, I think too that also points a little bit to how we worked. A lot of people ask us that, like, to you know, ha what was the process of design in which we came up with these ideas? And it was a lot of back and forth, a lot of discussions between us, um, a lot of model building and looking at you know trying out some ideas on the model and then going back and sort of thinking alone. And, and then coming back together. So it was, um, it was a very uh, kinetic process that, that, that we used um, in coming up with, with these things. It wasn't just like he came up with that and I came up with this and we put it together and, and that was that. It was, you know, a, it was a real team effort. And, and it's not all a calm effort either. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> we both feel very strongly about our ideas. <laughs> And um, I'm very proud to say that we're going to celebrate our 18th wedding anniversary <laughs> this year. Um, and, um, and we do appreciate the applause. <laughs> um, but it, you can begin to imagine uh, what it's like to, to share not only a passion for one another as a person, but also as professionals. And so. It, this was a very intense time for Tori and I, quite frankly, um, because we never left work. You know, when we were at home, we talked about the project. And when we went to the office, we talked about the project. You know, it never left us. And in many ways, it never will. Um, but, um, but anyways, it was, it's, it's, we feel privileged and very fortunate to, to be able to share uh, this as a part of our, our friendship as well, and, and now with our children as well. But um, it was also around this time on our, our, our little ski trip there where we were trying to make sense of the mission statement 
that a, a colleague of ours, Sven Bag, uh, we had worked with Sven in Germany for a few years already, but it was around this time that Sven started to get a little bit more involved with the design process. You know, Sven is a great guy. He, he bless his heart, he had to put up with Tori and I uh, through the latter parts of the project. And he eventually got folded into our team and helped us develop a lot of the construction drawings. But um, it was always interesting to talk to Sven about this design concept that we're sharing because you had, a, you know, I call Sven the real German. You know, I'm kind of half German, half American. Tori's the, 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 the ultimate American, Native American, in fact. But Sven gave us, he always gave us a very, very European point of view within the nature of all these discussions. And so, you know, we, we really believe that it was that viewpoint that continued to add to the rigor of our process and the rigor of developing, especially the details of the actual uh, memorial place. But, um, but anyways, this, this is a really important slide here up on the screen. Um, this here starts to give you an idea of the, the outline of the memorial site. It was a, it's a 3.3 acre site. And you may recall the, the, the photo before of the site looking south. It was taken from here. This here is the uh, survivor tree, Fifth Street, the footprint of the Murrah building, and then the footprints of the two buildings that were still uh, eventually uh, uh, taken down. But it was within the site itself that we started to make sense of the mission statement. And um, this really started to be where we tried to make sense and how those various pieces came together. Really, we, we, we thought of the memorial design as a story, the way an author creates a story. You have characters of a story that, that you bring in and take out of the story. And each of those characters bring a certain point of view. And it's that collection of points of view, those, the collection of characters, that are what help us make sense of the story as a whole. And so the way we started to understand the mission statement and the way we're presenting the, the design itself is really as a set of characters. And they all help us adjust portions of the story, of the body, <coughs> and of the site. And so, you know, as this diagram starts to suggest, the, um, the, the heart of the site was about 9.02, the moment the bomb went off. And it was ultimately that place where you know, we, we really thought about, this is where we understand those changed forever. But the site already told us, and that it was at the fo footprint of the Murrah building on the southern edge, where we would remember those who were killed. And directly across Fifth Street, opposite the site of, of those who were killed, was the survivor tree. And it so too became the natural place to celebrate survivors. And so the, this is really where the, the, the gist of the story, where you have Fifth Street as this mediating line, a datum, as we call it in architecture, and flanked to the south with the field of empty chairs, and juxtaposed opposite that east-west axis was the survivor tree, that place of celebration of survivors, but also a place of reflection. And so this really is what starts to uh, bring the ideas of the site and the mission statement together in what we were trying to create, you know, a very cohesive design. It's also important to note, you know, the mission statement, uh, the preamble didn't really mention the, the helpers, but yet I think anyone involved with the project recognized that there was a great amount of selflessness of people rushing in to help. You had doctors there doing immediate triage, and you had firemen, rescue workers, and the list goes on still today you have helpers giving of their time. They don't even think twice about the idea of whether they should give and help. And so we thought that as the design developed, that there should be some recognition of those who helped. Uh, and, and also, and, and those who helped like Rebecca, um, you know, she was one of those who, who fled to the site to help. Um, and within that, uh, that, that, that area of those who helped were the kids um, and like a special place for children um, to appreciate the children who helped because they too, children not only from Oklahoma City but from all over the country and the world also played a role in helping, I think, the people in the community. Um, you want to talk about the? Yeah, yeah, we're going to um, jump into a little bit of the, the geography of the site and uh, how we, more about the order of, of, 
of how we designed it. Um, this, the top, the, that top uh, diagram up there shows that slope Hans had talked about, um, that there was a pretty big slope that you know we had to deal with. Um, so what we did was just basically create a level platform right between you know the, the high point on Robinson and the lower point on Harvey, and um, create sort of a, a, a middle ground, a place where the memorial room would be. And, and then at each end of this would be these, these entry points, and those are marked by the gates that we'll talk to in just about, about in just a minute. But they were really became the transition points um, in two ways, really, um, physically, because you're mediating these height differences um, in one gate through a series of stairs, and one, in one gate through a series of ramps that take you up to that room. This gate takes you down to the memorial room. Um, and, and then also, um, kind of psychologically, those gates are two, are each made up of two walls, and so it gives you this space in between, this kind of just a moment of, of quietness, and before you go into that memorial room, you step away from that downtown area, kind of the traffic and the noise, and, and you step into this really quiet space, and if you look up, it's only sky. There's no beams going across, there's nothing, it's just the sky. And then you can go proceed into the memorial room. So that's how the site is set up. Okay, along with that site organization of, of where we're looking at those different groups. Other direction, um, we're juxtaposing. I don't if you guys remember the Hans talking about uh, those who were killed on the Murph, honoring those on the Murph uh, footprint, and then across from that, at the survivor tree, those who survived, and so those are being juxtaposed across this main datum or ordering line, where Fifth Street used to be. And um, you know that was a pretty big deal to shut off Fifth Street. I think, um, a fit, like, I think they had to jump through a lot of hoops to even get that accomplished. And if you just consider how important a grid system is for a city, especially in our South Midwest area, that um, grid cities—I mean, that's pretty pretty normal arrangement for cities. And to just stop a grid, like to take part of it away, is a very big deal. Um, and again, those gates, their scale, really talk about stop. You know, some you know something really happened here, and we're going to even change the way our cities, our, our streets move around this place. So we um, this this uh, pairing here is actually shows the design that we submitted for that first phase of this international competition. And as Tori mentioned before, there were it turns out 624 entries uh, from 23 foreign countries in all 50 states. But basically, that diagram we shared with you a moment ago, this is how it really started to take shape, both in the kind of physical model form, as well as in a very simple black and white drawing. You know, in this first phase of the competition, we didn't really want to get too much into color. Uh, we didn't feel like we understood the site enough. And so we really focused on uh, basically uh, tones of blacks and whites and focused on issues of light, of, of, of where you had qualities of somberness and you, where you had kind of brighter moments of, of, of joy and celebration. And, um, but here this model starts to help define that Fifth Street axis with the field of uh, what became 168 empty chairs to the south on the Murrah Building site and then towards the north here with the survivor tree on that natural high point, a series of terraces stepping down. But basically Fifth Street became that, that central zone around which all the characters of the story would gather. And it was very important to us, um, as we tried to make sense of it, to realize that in some ways, nobody can ever fully understand what happened here in Oklahoma City. Nobody can fully grasp or literally get at the heart of a tragedy like this. What motivates somebody to do this? How can we compute or make sense of this, that loss? How do we deal with it in the future? And so we decided actually to prevent people from getting at the physical heart of the site, that we all would always have to walk around that very heart. And so the reflecting pool um, that you see today uh, really took the place of that very center. And it allowed all the characters of the story, those who were killed, those who survived, and those changed forever, a place around which to gather and to continue to revisit the events of April 19th. And then um, we were uh, actually got this mysterious phone call on uh, April 
4th of 1997 uh, from one of the organizers of the competition. And she was saying, don't tell anyone we, we're calling you, but we want you to know that you're one of the five finalists. And we want to fly you to Oklahoma City in two weeks and introduce you to the community and allow you to get to meet the community. And so um, basically, you know, as you probably can appreciate, we were very overwhelmed. Um, you know, when you do competitions, you don't do it thinking you're going to win, right? And, and we've, you know, we've had success prior to this with competitions, but, you know, ultimately you're doing it, as Tori said, because you feel like you need to. You want to be a part of this and offer something to the community. And so never did we believe that we would actually be among those five teams. And so we, um, we were not only overwhelmed, but suddenly in a flurry because, you know, we had been moonlighting and now we had to tell these firms with which we were working, well, actually we have to fly to the United States. You know, it's kind of like this. And so, um, anyway, so suddenly we were rushed into a completely different phase of not only the project, but really in a phase of our lives that will never go away. And it's at this time that all five finalists were brought to Oklahoma City. And it was the first time we ever met anybody who survived. It was the first time we met anyone who lost a loved one in the bombing. It was the first time we met rescuers. And it was very, very difficult to make that shift from being just simply a design professional to being a human being trying to help other people through design work. And it really complicated things for us because it made it so much harder from there on out to make decisions about the design. And it was something that we were not prepared for. And um, but anyways, it was um, very overwhelming nevertheless, very humbling nevertheless. Uh, but we really started to try and think more carefully about, you know, here these are little scribbles from our sketchbooks of, of little moments that we anticipated in the memorial design, what it would be like to sit on the terraces. It was our first time to actually physically touch the site, to see the fence. And so we quickly then, we had about two months to develop the design. And it's that time of, that we started to add color and really okay, think about wait, I have to I have to interject materials. something. <laughs> um, I want to jump back to phase one because, um, or, or to the point where they let us know, let's go, you know, we're going to fly you guys out to Oklahoma City. And, um, uh, this is where we were beginning phase two, which we, they were, they were going to give us about two months for. But at the end, at this time, they flew us all out. They flew all the competitors, and this is this, the world of architecture. Where architects are not nice to each other, and so we all get there, and they made they put us all in a room, and they made us all present our designs to each other, and it was like it just felt like unheard of. It was just it was very odd for in you know in the world of architecture, and so. It took on already at that point, you know, when we're, 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 we're working together with our competitors, you know, we're not just out to beat them, we're out to help each other along, really. And so that was just amazing to me. It was amazing to us um, that that kind of difference already we were, we were a part of um, in this competition. Okay, sorry, um, we, you know, they said, phase two, you have two months, we want to see more details. Um, we want to see, you know, more descriptions. We want to give us a better understanding of what you've created. And we want a really big model. And we lived in Berlin. And so, <laughs> so we quit our jobs. Um, and we started working night and day. And we always took a walk. I remember working on this. And we always took a walk from about 3 to 4 a.m. around our block. <laughs> and just working really hard to try to get it, you know, to where we wanted it to be, to, to bring it back to Oklahoma City. And we personally escorted it all back to Oklahoma City um, in an effort to make sure that the model didn't break. And if it did, we would be there to repair it um, because this was just a huge thing. And we just thought, oh my gosh, if we can help you know, in this way, what an honor that would be for us. And um, um, so we, we came back for phase two. And another kind of really neat team moment there to me was that um, there was three. There was five teams as finalists. Three teams came to Oklahoma City to bring their stuff personally, and the other two teams sent it by mail. Um, well, I think one or two of the other models that came that didn't have people accompanying them were broken. I mean, they had parts that 
You know, there are pieces that there you know, were damaged somehow in the transport. And so all of the rest of us fixed their models. I mean, just, that is just amazing to me that um, in the world of architecture where it's fairly competitive, you know, that was the spirit. That was, we all knew it was a, it was a way bigger cause than we were typically used to working on. And so that, those are just small points that help demonstrate what an amazing process and it, this was to be a part of. And, and how wonderful, you know, people came together and just looked beyond themselves into this bigger goal. And um, the, the actual model that we, we escort is actually upstairs in the exhibit. And if you haven't been up there, please go. Uh, it's a fabulous exhibit. And there's a lot of, uh, or some of our process uh, from the uh, competition, the, in fact, the original competition board is actually up there, along with the mock-up of the chair and so forth. But, strongly encourage you to go upstairs and, and see that exhibit and the Madeleine Albright exhibit um, as well. But um, it was at this stage that, that, you know, we really started to have to think about color and materials. And, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, Freud would probably say that the emotional qualities that started to weigh on us more and more also kind of caused us to have to think more about color. Color is so much about emotion. And for us, the project became much more intense much more challenging. But uh, these were the three boards that we submitted for that final phase of the competition. And this time around, you know, the first phase was juried by five people, architects, planners, as well as uh, family members, survivors, and so forth. But the final phase of the competition for, the, for those five designs was actually juried by 15 people. And um, those 15 people were from you know, all walks of life, and very few of them were actually design professionals. Most of them were, you know, what we call normal people. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and knowing that really had, you know, caused us to have to, to do a much better job articulating our ideas and, and the symbolism behind the different parts of the design. And, um, and so, um, you know, what you see here really is just a description of, you know, and introducing the idea of of the chairs during the day or at night, the idea of the children's area, the gates, the reflecting pool, and so forth. And so this really started to become a, a much more detailed description of the design, and also the importance of how the memorial itself fit back into the city itself. This wasn't an isolated place. This was a part of a city. And so it was very important that we continue to develop the design that way so that it further integrates and people understand it as something that's part of Oklahoma City history. And then here's an image of that model that we uh, uh, escorted uh, to, um, to the site and an aerial image of the memorial concept as well as how it kind of reintegrates into that gridded uh, southwest uh, city. And now we're simply going to start walking you through the different elements just to show you images of our process, the way we work with models, sketches, drawings, and so forth. But really, this, this was also the phase of the project, you know, after they had selected our design, which was, you know, even, you know, more amazing, quite frankly, um, that, that things, I mean, it just kept getting more and more intense. And the more we got into the design and more into the process, the more we really started to get to know family members, survivors, and so forth, and really have to step it up in terms of how we talk about the design, the different elements, how each one develops, and to relate each element of the design back to the community's understanding of what took place. It was very much a dialogue, a project that had to keep building, escalating in its conversation with the community and with the tragedy, quite frankly. It was also important, you know, Tori keeps talking about um, referring to, you know, unique aspects from an architect's point of view in the process. Well, it was also unique from the standpoint that, excuse me, the relationship that we had to develop with our client and the responsibility of the Memorial Foundation, till today, um, they have an, an amazing understanding or sense of commitment and uh, a responsibility to those who were involved with the bombing in many different ways. They are an amazing client, amazing client, and the care they take for the people and the memorial place itself is, is remarkable. It's, it's, from what we've seen in the United States, it's their top notch. Um, but it was also an important process from the standpoint that 
you know, you can have all these design ideas and there can be all this symbolism, but it doesn't matter if, if it can't get built properly. And so the other job that we had was to communicate our ideas in the form of drawings and models so that the people out there could build it. And so it continued to, to have that dialogue, that engagement of the mission statement and the tragedy. And so they developed a very unique partnering process, uh, which is something that is a part of, of, of official kind of architecture processes today as a way to get everyone to buy in. A lot of times there's a lot of contention between architects and contractors, if you can imagine that. And, um, and so what the Memorial Foundation tried to do was to get everyone to buy in and say, there's a bigger picture here, everyone. And that is what you know, rules and how we make decisions. I mean, we even, the, all the people, the, the contractors and the construction guys, we even, together with them, developed a mission statement. So they, too, were in on it. You know, even, you know, Wendell, who drove the bulldozer, like, he was in on it. I mean, everyone just had such a commitment to try to fulfill this, you know, this responsibility to create a place of peace that would help the community and the nation. And I have to say, and I know Tori's going to hate the fact that I bring this up, she asked me last night not to, but um, <laughs> you can do this when you're when you're almost married, 18 years. Um, but Tori was on the site every day with a hard hat. Every day, I was still finishing graduate school when the construction started, and uh, you know you may think like she she looks like a sweet little girl here. But you you put a hard hat on her, and she is a bulldog. Okay, but in all seriousness, though. Tori being on site every day through all 15 months of construction was very important. It allowed the memorial, the mission statement, the community, family members, survivors to have a voice every day at the job site. And we really believed, and still do, that it was our job to funnel all that energy, all that passion, those goals of the mission statement through to each and every person that helped actually make the physical and she may have been in an upbred for all those people out there. Okay. But she is a bulldog. Anyways, um, so we're just simply going to walk through now just a series of slides. Um, and again, if you have questions, just write them down. Because we, we believe it or not, we'll probably have time to, for, for questions and answers. But just kind of walk you through the various characters of that story and, and, and the way each piece was developed. The gates of time, you know, the first really formal way in which you could engage the memorial site itself. There are those physical thresholds. And so we started to think of them in physical models, did a lot of computer digitaling, and also kind of these uh, complex architectural drawings as well to develop the designs and recognize that, you know, this may be a gate over here, but it changes the way you view the entire site. And so details had to be developed simultaneously and comprehensively throughout the site itself. Um, also, the, the scale of the gates. I don't know if that's like one of the, the biggest element at, in the outdoor memorial. And that was really an effort to try to relate to the fact that we were in an urban environment. I mean, we were right on the edge of downtown. There was all these tall, big buildings around. So we're trying to, you know, put something there that, that, that makes it feel like it relates in scale to its context. Um, and that is also on those gates is where we have that preamble to the mission statement on the outside of those gates. You know, we come here to remember that whole statement. So you know, right when you walk in, you're reminded of that statement. Uh, when you walk in and you look back at the gates, that's where we have 901 and 903. And we did have a lot of questions when we would go take these ideas to the community and talk to them about where we were in the process, um, about why don't you have 902? Why, why don't you write out the, you know, that time? And, you know, and we responded to them that, you know, it felt like we were just framing this moment and it was more powerful to not write it but that 902 was really referring to all the things that happened and what this whole story was about that was unfolding between these gates so anyway that's just more descriptions of the gates and and what kind of role they played right. the 901 and 903 is also important because the gates were really a way of rem reminding people of the larger historical context of what took place on April 1995 you know, 901 for us symbolized American history before the bombing. It was really it was more about innocence. And the 901 gate is actually situated on the eastern side of the memorial site. And so the morning sun rises over the 901 gate. 
and it reminds us of a certain innocence of optimism that we have in those more early morning hours. And then the site gives way to 902, which is you know, so much of what happened. And 903 on the western edge side of the setting sun is symbolizes or reminds us that you know, how are we going to deal with this tomorrow, both in a literal sense but also more in kind of a historical sense that you know, to this day we continue to grapple with the historical significance of tragedies like this. You just turn on the TV right now and all they're talking about is this ongoing effort to understand why would somebody do this. And so the gates of 901 and 903 were very much about trying to you know, point to a larger historical context as well. So here you see the, you know, the, the preamble, as Tori just mentioned. The, the bronze is there as, as a, a kind of a, a monumental material that changes ages with time, yet it has a very durable uh, quality to it. And here you also see the lighting. Uh, the, the gates are actually the brightest at the top, and the light kind of fades down to zero at, at night, so that during the day, the gates have a very strong, uh, heavy presence, but at night, the way they are lit, they begin to dissolve up towards the heavens. Here's that, that transition space Tori referred to as you move through the gates, the hustle bustle of the city into the sacred site itself. Here you can see the gates framing what are the two remaining freestanding walls of the Alfred P. Murrah building, and also significantly framing that place where you have the names of the survivors. Um, there were many survivors uh, of, of the blast, and their names are inscribed in these pieces of granite that were taken from the Murrah Plaza and uh, hung on these surviving walls. And so the names of survivors and the gates have a very strong spatial relationship in that site. And now the um, evolution of the idea of the chairs. Um, the, the, the chair is such a, a simple way for us to answer the question of how do you engage or recall the loss of an individual, as well as how do you engage the loss of 168 members of our community. So, and the chairs really had a, a kind of a, a, a way of allowing us to mediate that scale of the individual as well as a collective group. And so we, we really tried to, to work up ways in which they would have a presence during the day and at night. It's a 24-hour, 365-day memorial. But the other uh, important detail that, that we believe was, was important to communicate, again, this being a site of the tragedy, was the fact that you had 19 children who were among those victims. And so we believed it was appropriate that 19 of those 168 chairs be smaller to make much more clear the impact of this violence and the senselessness, uh, destruction of innocence. The chairs are arranged in nine rows, uh, one row for each floor of the building. The number of chairs in each row speaks to the number of victims who worked or uh, were visiting on that particular floor. And so here in the slide here in the lower right, you can begin to see the density of chairs is very varied, it's quite varied. And the, the greatest amount of density of the chairs actually begins to speak of the amount of damage uh, that was sustained by the Murrah building itself. And so these chairs, or the light that they emit, begin to fill the void that was created in the Murrah building itself. I think, too, something to throw out about the chair. You know, I mean, I don't know if a lot of people well, a lot of people have asked us, you know, why the chair? Why did you think of that? I think for us, it was, it was just such a simple, familiar object to use that can recall both someone's absence and their presence. We can imagine when we see an empty chair, we know someone's not there. But we can also imagine that person and, and their presence. So it has this... I don't know, for us it had, that simple object had a lot of power to recall both absence and presence almost simultaneously. And, and it seemed like something that could speak to all ages and in, to people in different cultures. So it had the ability to speak across a lot of lines. And the symbolism, you know, the symbolism of the empty chair is rather universal throughout cultures, throughout the world. Um, and, you know, it's, and it's also important to note, for example, that the, the Pentagon Memorial, September 11th, Memorial outside the Pentagon actually uh, has benches incorporated into their design. 
you know, and then the completely opposite end, you know, I was just talking to my sister uh, last night. She's a school teacher in a very tough part of Austin, and she shared that one of her uh, former students was killed, and that, their, that the student's classmates decided to, to leave that student's desk in the back of the room empty as a, as a reminder of, of the loss that they've all collectively experienced. And it's a very gentle way of, of coming to grips for many people in situations like this. The, um, you know, the materials of the chairs was very important, that it begins to, to respond to different types of light at different times of the year. And so we, we, you know, the chairs were really a, a two and a half year project in and of themselves. The amount of research in terms of glass, you know, we wanted a glass base so that during the day, the, the chairs would almost start to feel like they floated. Um, and then at night, your understanding of the chair would reverse and it would, you would have this luminous vessel uh, uh, glowing and shedding light into the dark sky. And so we spent a lot of time just researching the glass, what kind of glass, how it would go together in a way that people could easily maintain it over the years, how you would uh, fabricate it, and also how it could handle the freeze-thaw cycles. You know, you, you probably get a little bit of that here as well. You know, it can get really hot, and then all of a sudden, you know, you have a rain shower in the afternoon, things cool off, the temperature drops 40 degrees. Well, glass doesn't like to, to go through those kinds of changes, and so we had to, you know, think of very, uh, very important issues like that. We thought about the proportions of the chairs to make sure they, they took on the right proportion, uh, evoking the, the presence of a, of a person. We had a lot of uh, testing done at MIT in Boston uh, of the glass to see how different ways of making the glass bases could withstand the shift of the heat. Uh, here you see actually two versions of the glass base on the rooftop of the Department of Ceramics at MIT. The roof would get up to 140 degrees and then we would shock the glass with cold water and measure temperature and the, the nature of the stresses that the glass would undergo. So it was a very complex technical process as well as one, you know, involving, you know, really what we you know, deem to be poetics or symbolism. Here's the fabrication of the individual pieces of glass. It was very important that we be there throughout the making of the chairs as well. Thinking about materials and how they age. Here you see a, a fresher new bronze for the seat and back of the chair compared to a piece of bronze that aged over the site and the way the materials would read with time. And certainly the lighting of the chairs, you know, developing something that, that wouldn't need ongoing maintenance. It was very rare that a light would go out. In fact, we just recently replaced the lighting of, of all the chairs with LED uh, lighting. Now the technology is far enough to allow the Memorial Foundation to save on operational costs. And here an image you see on the left of the chairs at night where the focus is really on that glowing volume and then during the day the way the emphasis is a little bit more on the uh, seats uh, themselves. And, and one thing that you will see if you visit um, and that's more evident in person is that um, these these chairs, the, the, the seat and back are made of bronze as Hans, as Hans mentioned. Um, we chose bronze for both the gate and the chairs and it's not a sealed bronze. If we had sealed it, it would kind of retain that gold sheen but we chose not to because if you don't seal it, then when people touch it, they can those handprints stay. And rather than think of that as them being dirty, we thought that is wonderful that we're seeing you know real instances or, or occasions where people are um, interacting with this memorial and um, engaging it in their own personal way. And so you have those handprints on the chairs as people come in contact with them as well as the gates, and we, and our daughters have even done it, and we didn't even think, th think that this would happen, but with the gates, I think a lot of people go put their, water, their hands in the water, and then they go put it on the gates, and so when you look at those gates, you just see, if you look up, you know, from the lower level, and you look up, you just see all these handprints going up the gate, and it's just wonderful um, how people have figured out ways to interact, and that was, uh, you know, partly for, it, you know, we, we were hoping for that kind of interaction in choosing that material. And, and another, you know, detail of the, of the chairs themselves, um, you know, the chairs very much are about telling the story of, of 168 individuals. And the, the um, textures of the glass itself, you know, we used, uh, you know, worked with an artist in California, actually, and um, wanted very much the textures of the glass have some sort of symbolic relevance. And so the exterior texture of the glass is actually book binding leather. And 
the interior is of a handmade rice paper. And we really start to think of that as, as real, almost a literal story of each person, the way that each chair, because it's, each one is handmade, takes on its own personality. Each one is different from the next. And the same with the bronze. It's all handmade by a group of very proud artisans in Oklahoma City who, 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 who uh, you know, welded and brazed and, and smoothened out all that material, but still allowing for each one to take on its own character, to tell its own story of those uh, 168 individuals. The survivor tree is obviously an important part of understanding the story and the fate of those who survived. And um, here you see, you know, in that uh, competition rendering, the survivor tree itself, surrounded by what we call the survivor's orchard, or the rescuer's orchard. And, um, you know, obviously when you design a memorial, you invite people to come in and, and see the site. The concern, however, was that you know, those hundreds of thousands or millions now of people who would stand on the survivor tree might actually compact the soil to the point where the tree could die. And so we had to develop, you know, a very elaborate paving system that kept people actually off of the, the soil itself. And so here you can see, you know, this elaborate structure that was developed so that this, the, the paving that you walk on is actually elevated. It allows the natural rain to go and continue uh, feeding uh, the tree and the air to regenerate, aerate the soil, and so forth. But a lot, of, a lot of technical details that had to go into trying to achieve what would be perhaps more important, that was to embody the mission statement. Materials, materiality, as we mentioned, this is an Oklahoma tragedy that has national and international ramifications. And so we really looked to literally the Oklahoma landscape and the soil itself for clues about the materials we would choose, the way we would develop the detailing of those materials. Of, of um, you know, Most of the sandstone actually comes from around Fort Smith, actually. It's beautiful, beautiful hard stone. Actually, we like to use it in a lot of our projects now, in fact. But there are so many different ways you can cut stone, and the way you cut it can symbolize and evoke uh, different ideas of space and so forth. And so, we, you know, Tori prepared these watercolors to help us think through some of those types of details. We had physical mock-ups made of the different materials to see how they would start to go together and to use these mock-ups to, to engage the community and say, this is how the design continues to develop. This is how the mission statement continues to be embodied by all these uh, details of, choice, of material and, and the way they can come together. The children's area, as Tori mentioned, you know, such an important place to allow children a place to understand the tragedy, but in a way that's perhaps a little bit more gentle. And so in the northwest corner of the site here is, is a series of uh, chalkboards that allows people, uh, children, but you know, it's, it's always beautiful to see grandparents on their hands and knees with chalk next to their grandkids, writing on the uh, uh, chalkboards, you know, these, these, uh, uh, these kind notes. Um, and so in fact, here's a note regarding Rebecca but herself. Um, and then tiles that were, were mailed to uh, the Memorial Foundation that we thought were just so beautiful that they had to find a way into the memorial itself as a reminder that, you know, amongst all this, this horror, this tragedy, you know, children are that ultimate symbol of hope. And so the, you know, the innocence of their handprints, you know, is a way to continue to inspire adults like us to be better, to try harder, and to do a better job preparing, you know, the world for them. Rescuer's Orchard, you know, this image of rescuers working through the rubble. But it was important, you know, as we mentioned before, to recognize those who came in selflessly to help and, and to pull people out, and to, 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 to raise their chance of survivor, survival. And, you know, we, we developed this idea along the lines of, of fruit and flower bearing trees that you could see over the years these life cycles and remember that, that the survivors are the fruits of the work of rescuers and that you could see through that symbolization, you know, the importance of their work, and also to see how the site would change. And so we have, you know, you know olives growing, we have uh, uh, red bud blossoms and so forth, little helicopter seeds that drop in the fall. But we also started to think a bit about the color and the way the trees would change your, the site. In the spring, you have brighter, more yellowy and purple colors, but then in the fall, you know, trees drop their leaves, the American elm, the survivor tree, takes on this beautiful yellow color. 
Chinese pistache become this blazing uh, red-orange. And it was so nice to get this image not too long ago of the memorial, and it really, you know, strikes at the heart of what we were hoping to achieve with this, you know, these blazing colors um, to kind of remind us of that, that evolution of life, life cycles. And it's also amazing just to see how the, the Labali trees have, have grown over the years, continue to create a much safer, much more secure place around the field of empty chairs. And finally, the, that, that, that important character of the story that tells so much, the reflecting pool, you know, that place that fills the void around which the other characters gather, and realizing that you know, in, in Oklahoma wind, you have to figure out how to you know, keep the water in the pool. You have to recognize that, that um, you, know, you, you have in the winter, it can it freeze, and you may have to drain the pool. And so for us, it was important to detail the pool so that not only would the, the water hold in it, but that if you had to drain it, that, that the, the materials that we used, and in this case, it was black granite, um, if you drained it, it would still have this beautiful black sculptural presence to anchor the memorial site. And so again, a lot of technical issues that, that had to go into it. And, and you know, the, the pool is only three quarters of an inch thick. And it's actually through very basic aspects of physics, hydrostatic pressure and, and capillary action, that allows the water to stay in the pool. The night the memorial was dedicated, we had 45 mile per hour winds, and yet the entire perimeter of the pool was still dry. And, that's a, and it's a testament really to all the, the consultants and engineers that we worked with that helped us bring to the community a design that, that you know, needed to embody that mission statement. Um, but earlier, Hans mentioned that the pool, um, we really saw that as the place where everyone came and kind of gathered at this edge of the pool. And that was one idea we had. We, saw, we really saw this, um, this reflecting pool as a table. And it was this really flat, large expanse of table. And that just fits so perfectly into the metaphor of that's where we all gather. And that's where you look in and you see your reflection. And you see the reflection of someone that was changed forever. And and, and and you also see you see the reflection of the city around, and you see the reflection of the chairs, and and uh, we thought there was you know just poetically that that seemed the the what the message we wanted to get across. Um, another thing the pool does, and it's more evident at night, is that uh, it it creates this this really soothing background noise. It's just this beautiful sound of water falling, and I think that's you know just how somehow water is soothing to our soul. We don't know exactly why, but it is. And at night, it seems even more apparent because I think you have the envelope of darkness around you, and maybe you're, you know, you're more tuned in to, to the sounds. But you know, as soon as you walk through those gates and you hear it, you know, that water is really soothing, and it just helps set the, the tone for your experience in going around and, and seeing the different parts of the memorial. Here are the, uh, the handprints to which Tori referred. Related to, to remind us scale, the enormity of the event, but yet it still is, you know, it's about human life. And certainly, you know, one of the reasons we moved to Oklahoma City and, and stayed there is because we realized that, that this is an ongoing process. You know, just because the memorial was built doesn't mean the discussion ends. It, it goes on. And, and the, the things that caused it have, you know, haven't gone away, the sense of loss and tragedy of hurt hasn't gone away. And so, you know, the, the, the ability for the memorial to simply serve as a forum for people to continue the discussion. The Memorial Foundation, um, uh, with, with the bold vision that it has, not only created the memorial itself, but also a museum, as well as a center for the Institute of Prevention of Terrorism. And they recognize that, that you need to continue to prepare. You need to educate and do research see what you can do to prevent things like this. And I think that they also feel like the message they're spreading is is about not only the you know the, the bad things that happened here, but the good that came out of it. And so a lot of what they do is try to teach other places they go. They've gone to talk to people in New York and people in Pennsylvania and people in other pl places that have experienced a tragedy. And how do we deal with this and come out uh, on the positive side? How do we turn this around and make it into something positive? Um, so I think, gosh, if we really have to try to take something away from this, you know, that, that's good. And we've learned so much. Oklahoma is just a shining example 
of what people can do when something bad happens. So, you know, as the slides you know wrap up now, um, you know, we're reminded you know, you know Wednesday evening President Clinton will be honored at the Reflections of Hope dinner uh, for all the work that he's doing through this foundation, and also. Um, you know, the memorial is still a site for uh, a beautiful concert. Uh, this is actually the, the, uh, the medal that President Clinton will receive. You know, there are still many concerts. People gather at the memorial site to celebrate life, uh, to remind us of, of the need for hope in our lives. Um, and certainly, you know, as we prepare, both Tori and I, uh, uh, for the marathon next week, um, it's just yet another way in which the memorial serves as that backdrop ongoing cycle of life and how we try to make sense of, of tragedies such as this. And how it's really a living memorial. I mean, I think one thing that we hear them say about the marathon all the time, it's not about running, it's about living. And that's what they're trying to celebrate is, you know, they're again, they're trying to take something that, that happened and turn it around and be really positive and then just keep spreading that message and it becomes this, this you know, this, a place to celebrate life. So... Thank you. Yeah, thank if, you. If you we do have time for a couple quick questions. If you do, we'll please raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. I know it was very informative there. Bill. Yeah, the, um, the, the overall budget for the outdoor memorial, the construction, was $7.85 million, um, uh, which is not a lot, actually, when you compare it to other memorials. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial was $17 million. Um, so we had serious constraints, and, and you know, we've, we're very proud to say that, that, that it came in $200,000 under budget. Um, you know, it, there was amount of, the amount of pride and responsibility with the people who built it. I mean, you have to give them so much, so many props. Uh, because you can't do it without the people actually making it. Okay. What was the length of time when you actually started until you knew you were getting paid? It was uh, January 97 was when we started the design process. Um, and then we found out on July 1st that uh, our design had been selected. So it was about, you know, roughly six months. Or so. But you've been working on it a lot longer. No, we only started working on it in January of that year is when we started working on the competition. So that first design phase was really fast. Yeah. It, it wasn't very much time. <laughs> I, want to, I want to bring um, Stephanie Street up here, the executive director of the Clinton Foundation. She has a few words to say. Hans and Tori, thank you again for being here um, as we commemorate this 15th anniversary. And what an outstanding presentation. I was really moved to hear the story behind your design. And I think it speaks volumes that you have actually decided to make Oklahoma City your home. So we really thank you for being here with us again. Um, we're also grateful to everyone who came to, the, to this important lecture today and to be with us as we mark this very solemn occasion, especially the family members, rescue workers, and survivors. We are so honored by your presence here today. I hope you'll all have a chance, um, as Hans mentioned, to visit this extraordinary exhibit we have here in partnership with the Oklahoma City uh, National Memorial uh, and Museum. It'll be on display through June 1st, so if you haven't had an opportunity, please, during this period, come back and really spend some time. It's just amazing. It includes photographs, video, and perhaps most moving artifacts and personal possessions from the scene. It's poignant, it's personal, and it is a time, a day, and a place we will never forget. And this exhibit ultimately serves as an honor to the victims and their families and to the community that once again embraced hope. Thank you all. <laughs>